Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've had already a number of highlights today, and I'm pleased to say we're approaching yet another highlight. It's my pleasure to guide you through three keynote speeches. Sounds like a train is running through this room. My name is Susanna Slivensky. I'm the deputy director of the ECML. Uh, I'm the head of programs. I'm saying this uh, not to those who know me already. I'm saying this to the online audience. Um, we are going to have a session, a series of keynote speeches on cooperation, on European cooperation in language education to build a better Europe. So this is a rather pertinent topic, and uh, in my daily job, it's, uh, it's vital to facilitate cooperation, to facilitate cooperation in language education at the European level. So I very much look forward to the input our, of our distinguished keynote speakers. The first speaker is Schubergen, the head of the education department and currently director ad interim of democratic citizenship and participation of the Council of Europe. He represents the Council of Europe on the Bologna follow-up group and board, and he was the main author of the Council of Europe com recommendation, uh, recommendations on the public responsibility for higher education, on academic freedom and institutional autonomy, and on ensuring quality education. Schubergen is also a series editor of the Council of Europe's higher education series. Sure, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and I look forward to your input. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Susanna. Merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. Donc, tant uh, Francis Goulier comme Lucien Fledjan ont parlé juste avant la pause de l'importance de valeur, de la valeur de l'éducation. Et vous ne serez peut-être pas surpris si je vous dis que je parlais de ça. Nous sommes en fait, nous sommes en fait pour plusieurs raisons. Nous sommes en fait parce que, comme déjà a été dit, aujourd'hui c'est la, la journée internationale des droits de l'homme. Donc pour le Conseil dédié à la démocratie, aux droits de l'homme et à l'état de droit, c'est un, un jour important. Nous sommes en fait parce que nous fêtons la concrétion d'un programme de cinq ans du Centre européen de langue vivante et en même, en même temps le lancement de nouveaux programmes. Et nous sommes en fait parce que euh, cette année marque aussi les 20 ans du Centre à Graz. Ce n'est pas un grand âge, mais euh, le Centre ne pourra bientôt plus dire comme excuse « je n'ai plus 20 ans euh, ». Ich möchte mich dabei auch sehr herzlich bei den österreichischen Behörden bedanken, Stadt, Land und Bund, ohne diese starke Beteiligung Österreichs wäre, was wir hier gemacht haben, was wir hier machen, wäre ganz einfach gar nicht möglich. So, wirklich ein sehr, sehr großes Dank sein und Dank sagen an Österreich. And then I'll switch to English to talk about what I've been asked to talk about. Um, why would we actually want a better Europe? Well, I think in 2015, we've had a good number of reminders of why we might actually want a better Europe. I live in France, and France has certainly had uh, a good number of reminders this year, at the beginning and now also in November, but we're not the only ones. God has had its reminder also, and um, we have all had our reminders. I don't need to describe the refugee crisis, the terrorist attacks, and all the different challenges in detail. What they really boil down to is we've lost or seem to be losing the ability and the will to dialogue. We have seen throughout this year that populism is on the rise. Now you can say many things about populism, I have one definition of it, and I'll offer it to you. To me, populism is above all a lack of education. Why do I say that? Because populism offers very simplistic solutions, quote unquote, to very complex problems. 
That is not something that we can do as educationalists. So the case for a better Europe is not that difficult to make. But what does it look like? To some people, it looks like this. Fortress Europe. Well, actually, these days, Fortress Europe actually sounds like a broad-minded, inclusive solution. We're not actually, people here are not claiming for Fortress Europe. They're claiming for Fortress, my country, my region, and my city. But do you want to see Europe as a collection of gated communities? I don't. And this kind of fortress, it might provide a sense of physical security, but that sense might also be false. I don't know whether you recognize the photo, probably not, unless you've been there. This is one of the forts of the Maginot Line. Now, the Maginot Line was built on the French-German border in the early 30s. It was made, built on two assumptions. First assumption, there will be a Second World War. Second assumption, like in the First World War, the attack will come straight across the border. The people who built the Maginot Line were half right. There was a Second World War, but the attack didn't come across the border. And the guns of this fortress were not flexible enough to turn around to where the attack actually came from. So the sense of security it provided is very illusory. Today it has found a second purpose in life, it's a museum. And it provides you an image, a very good image actually of this particular fort, of what life must have been like inside the fortress. Now I can tell you if there's one thing it must have been like, it must have been utterly boring. Again, a fortress, whether it's a fortress, my country, my region, or it's a fortress, Europe, lack of diversity, lack of challenges intellectually and otherwise, utterly boring. And you know what? We're not the only ones who kind of like, would like to construct a fortress inside which there is no diversity. Isn't this what Daesh is also trying to construct? So we have a better idea of what Europe, a better Europe can be like. This is the Council of Europe, 47 member states. We'd like to have some more when conditions, for example, in Belarus would allow them. But it's built on democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. What do you think about when you hear about democracy? Well, if you look at school textbooks, you will probably think about institutions, so we have a parliament, therefore we have democracy. You would think about laws. We have um, a constitution that says we are a democracy, therefore we are a democracy. I'm not saying this is not important. Clearly, you cannot have democracies without elected representative institutions. You cannot have democracies without democratic constitutions and democratic laws. What I am saying is not quite enough. You also need what we have come to talk about as variously democratic culture or a culture of democracy. Well, what is it? It is really the set of attitudes and behaviors that enable these institutions and these laws actually to work as democracies in practice. We do not particularly speak about diversity, about intercultural dialogue in that sense. Because quite simply, it's part and parcel. I cannot imagine a democracy that would not be able and willing to conduct intercultural dialogue. And I cannot imagine that an intercultural dialogue would entirely be conducted in a society that is not democratic because it requires this kind of exchange, this kind of openness of mind that means that when you're in a discussion, it's not always just to convince the others. You might actually also learn something from the others. So it's very much about what in history teaching we have come to talk about as multi-perspectivity. It's easy to practice up to a point. 
Multiperspectivity in history, to, history works beautifully when I can have my opinion on your history. It works a little bit less well when you have an opinion on my history and that's not the same as mine. But nevertheless, that's the part of what democracy is about. So, since we're in the education context, you all know about learning outcomes, right? It's what you know, what you understand, and what you're able to do. That's a classical definition of learning outcomes. We've actually come to believe that that's not quite enough. It's not only what you're able to do, it's also what you're willing to do, and sometimes what you're willing to abstain from doing. Because you may be able to do things that for moral, ethical, other reasons, you should not do. So, in all of this, why should we bother with education? Why would anybody want to go to school? Now, we talk about the right and the obligation to go to, to undertake education. I'm sure that if you ask the average 10-year-old or 12-year-old, they will not talk about their right to education. They will talk about my parents, my teacher, making me go to school. So why do, why do people actually go to school? I'll give you the seven most frequently cited reasons for why people go to school. Here you have all seven of them. <laughs> Unless this, of course, this has been very much the public discourse about education. Education is seen as an instrument only to get a good job, only as preparation for the labor market. We have a different view. And we're not saying, and I would really want to emphasize this, we're not saying that education is not important in preparing for the labor market. We cannot conceive of an advanced, complex economy based on ignorance. But we also cannot conceive of an advanced, complex, democratic society based on ignorance. So, preparation for employment, preparation for democratic citizenship, but also personal development, and as societies we need to develop a broad and advanced knowledge base. All of this is important. All of this is equally important. And the good news is, there is no contradiction here. Many of the competences and qualities that make you employable to stay with the dragon of the times also enable you to play an active role as active citizens and they contribute to your personal development. Things like analytical ability, the ability to communicate, to present your case, but also to assess what others might be saying. So, since so many people actually talk about employment, we talk more about the democratic citizenship aspect. And we really think that education does have a democratic mission. If you look at these three bullet points, which I hope you can read, because I'm not going to read them out, if the first one has to do with attitudes, the second has to do with ability, and the third one has to do with action. Remember the learning outcomes? Well, here you see them a bit applied in practice. And since we're short of time, again, I'm not going to read them out or comment further. But we have said that if you really want preparation for life as active citizens in democratic society to be part and parcel of the mission of education, we have to say something about the kind of competences that our education systems will provide students with at different levels of education. So we launched a project under the chairmanship of Andorra, of the Committee of Ministers, to try to define this. So we want to develop a framework for competences for democracy. And it's a bit like squaring the circle. You have to be detailed enough to be meaningful, but not so detailed that people get lost. And as you know, the ability of people like me, the policymakers, to actually deal with complexity is sometimes a bit limited. Um, we have to make it non-binding, so what we're offering is a model that you can adapt or adopt. Nobody will prevent you from 
using it as it is, but if you feel that you need to adapt it in your own countries, fine. And you should be able to teach it. Of course, students should be able to learn it. And not least, one should be able to assess the competences. Because if you can't assess it, it probably won't end up in formal education. So this is what we came up with. I hope it will be put on a website so it will be more readable. Um, this has been variously described as a butterfly or as a clover. Um, the expert group that working on it is, uh, is in disagreement on this. I would personally go for the butterfly because even though butterflies don't live forever, at least they move. And if you're a clover, you stay put and you get eaten by cows and sheep. Um, but you will see we center this around values, attitudes, skills, and knowledge and critical understanding. And again, the intention, we have 20 different competences here, and we will describe, we are describing how this might be translated into learning outcomes. Again, time does not allow me to go into great detail, but I would like to I would like to point to three elements that have been challenging. The first element is critical thinking. In some of our member states, if you say critical, you're seen as somebody who really just tears things down. You're against this and this. Well, yes, very often you will be against something. But there's more to critical thinking than just being against. Critical thinking also implies that you have to construct an alternative. Being, knowing what you're against is the easy part. Constructing the alternative is the difficult part. And in a democracy, we have to construct that alternative. The second is, all of this is great in theory. But to what extent should schools and university actually encourage and enable students to take the theoretical understanding of their competences for democracy and transform them into action. Action, all of a sudden, is much more threatening. But a very common criticism of education is actually that it provides the theory, but it doesn't actually encourage students to do the practice. If you hear about once part of the business community, for example, says about education, it's precisely that. That students don't have the skills and the competences to transform their ideas into entrepreneurship, for example. Well, why shouldn't we also encourage them to transform their theoretical understanding into um, citizenship action? And the third point is, I said, it needs to be teachable, learnable, and accessible. How do you assess that? In particular, the criticism that's been raised is, how would you assess values? And I think part of the challenge here is that when people hear, think about assessment, they think about grades. There's more to assessment than just assigning a grade. I'm sure that as a teacher, if you have a student in class, who very clearly through his or her behavior demonstrates disrespect for other students in the class, whether it's because they are disabled, whether it's because they have a different ethnic origin or a different belief. As a teacher, your assessment would be that you have to correct that behavior and try to teach that student that actually diversity is not a problem, it's a richness. And it is unacceptable to behave in that way with a common fellow human being. So you've heard about action plans. I guess we have one um, to fight uh, violent extremism and radicalization leading to terrorism. It's not difficult to understand why we have this. What is new about this action plan is that whereas 10, 15 years ago, I'm sure such an action plan would only be a legal action, legal action. Now, education and this project is a very important part of it. But in a sense, that is the negative action plan. We're also getting a positive action plan, which is building inclusive societies. We hope it will be adopted next Wednesday by the Committee of Ministers. And again, education is an important part of it. The project on 
democratic culture, but here especially, the recognition of qualifications for refugees. Refugee, if you're a refugee, if you're put into passivity, if you cannot use your qualifications, if you cannot build on them, you will lose your qualifications, you will build up frustration, and you will become a problem to your host society if you cannot go home, and to your home country if you can go home. If you can build on the qualifications you already have, I won't say that it will be a positive experience to be a refugee, because I don't think it can ever be, but at least you can use this time to build further and be a resource, whether that's for your host country or eventually for your home country. And we do have a massive issue of access to education, both for refugees, for immigrants in religious situations, but also in some of our countries for street children. And then, as we know, if you want to integrate, you need language. Can we think of democracy without language? Well, actually asking the question is already using language. Um, now, what do you do with democracy? Well, you speak your mind, you listen to others, you think, you analyze, you absorb last amount of information, in other words, you use language. Language is a fascinating topic in itself, and I'm one of the people who are fascinated by language. And yet, language has an importance that goes beyond the intrinsic interest of language systems, vocabularies, etc. It is really a building stone of our democracies. And the ECML is part and parcel of it. As you know, it's a, what we call a partial agreement. Doesn't mean that there's disagreement elsewhere. Um, it's just that it's a technical formula to say that this is a special agreement that you can become a member of as a country. And I think the current status is 33, which is really very good. But we have room for more. So just feel welcome to join us. And the ECML uses the language instruments that we have developed. And it is, and I want to underline this, it is part and parcel of our education program. And it's an important part of it. So the ECML, yes, it helps you develop language competences. But it also helps you develop citizens. It helps you improve your education. And I'll close with a reference to two of my favorite quotes on education. Incidentally, none of them from Europe. The first from North America. There's an American journalist called Ambrose Beers, who was active in the first part of the 20th century. He had the misfortune of writing into the Mexican Revolution. And that was the last anyone heard of him. But uh, before he rolled off, he left behind what he called a, the Devil's Dictionary. And in it, he defined education as that which reveals to the wise and hides from the foolish their lack of understanding. Not exactly the instrumentalist view of education, but the one to which I subscribe, as I do to the next one, which comes from South America. The Chilean sociologist, Eugenio Tironi, um, says, if you really want to find the answer to the question, what kind of education do we need? First, you need to answer the other question, which is, what kind of society do we want? Now, I'll go back to my roots to try to answer that. And Well, these guys are off to battle. Um, so that's perhaps not a very appropriate metaphor, but it just so happens that Vikings did occasionally go to battle, as you may know. But that's not the point of this illustration. The point is, they're on their way to a common goal, but they take different routes to get there, and together they need to communicate. And the road, the common goal that we all will get to through different routes has to be in society in which we respect our diversity, but in which we also respect our diversity in such a way that we try to overcome the divides of communication. That can only be through, done through language, and that can, I think, 
best be done through the European Center for Modern Languages. Happy birthday. Happy International Day of Human Rights, and thank you very much for your attention.